Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, mori mori wanji, namaste, jambo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you'll join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, wherever you find your podcast. Today, my incredible intern, Mirabella Q, joins me to interview Emma Carlson Byrne. He's celebrating Books by Horseback, a librarian's brave journey to deliver books to children. Before we invite our guests into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Harry's First Martial Arts Lesson, a children's book on self-discipline, respect, concentration, focus, and setting goals. It's part of Sarah Belisa Tucker's Adventures of Harry and Friends series. Harry is super excited to take his first martial arts lesson. He quickly learns that martial arts is not just about punching and kicking, but about treating people with respect and learning self-control. His new mentor, Instructor Dan, helps him understand that the keys to learning anything, whether it be martial arts or mathematics, are concentration and self-discipline. The Adventures of Harry and Friends is a new series of children's books grown from the award-winning Harry and Friends Black Belt Principles Character Education Program that's been used in martial arts schools around the world since 1999. You're going to love the series. It's really, really wonderful. The illustrations are fantastic. The writing, the stories are really, really fun. It's a great addition to any family library. Get your copy today. It's book number two in the Adventures of Harry and Friends series, Harry's First Martial Arts Lesson by Sarah Belisa Tucker. I am really, really excited today. I've You hear me in the shows thanking my team. One of the members of my team here in the summer of 22 is a fantastic student at Emerson College. Her name is Mirabella Q, and she is going to co-host the show with me today. Hey, Mirabella, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Jen? I'm wonderful. Mirabella is also here in the great state of Massachusetts with me. Uh, but our guest today is coming to us from Cincinnati in Ohio. Hey, Mirabella, do you want to introduce our guest, please? I'd love to. Um, Today we have Emma Carlson Byrne. She's an author of over 100 books for young readers, middle schoolers, and young adults. Um, She lives in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, She ghostwrites under a couple of different names and studied at Oxford. She, her most recent book is The History of the American Revolution, a history book for new readers published in September 20, September 21. Um, she's lived in many places, Wisconsin, South Carolina, England, and Israel, which I'd love to get into. Um, and she was born in Clifton and raised in Wyoming. And yeah, she's got so many books. Uh, we really want to focus on the Books by Horseback uh, edition she wrote, and that is focusing on Appalachia, which is what I'm very interested in. So welcome to the show, Emma. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I usually like to do is to just start off by asking our author to tell us about their book. Right. So, uh, Mirabella, thank you for that great introduction. So I am so um, looking forward to talking about the the book that we're going to be discussing, which is called Books by Horseback, and it's a picture book. And um, because we're on... Uh, we're on audio. I'll read to you that the subtitle is Books by Horseback, A Librarian's Brave Journey to Deliver Books to Children. And this is a picture book that I wrote, published by Little Bee um, Press um, last April. It's illustrated by Ilaria Urbanati, who is um, an Italian illustrator, did a great job. And this tells the fictional story of a real um, project called the Pack Horse Library Project, which ran in eastern Kentucky during the 1930s. It was a WPA project, and it was basically bookmobiles on horseback. Um, the people who lived in this area of eastern Kentucky lived in very um, inaccessible mountains, and it was very hard for them to get books of any kind. And so, um, actually, Eleanor Roosevelt was a 
heavy sponsor of this project, and um, the State Librarian of Kentucky. They all worked together to set up a series of um, librarians who would ride out into the mountains um, every day and uh, deliver books and pick up books people were done with, um, and then bring them to a, another house or cabin. And, you know, they had to go on horseback because at this point in eastern Kentucky, um, in this particular area, there were um, not only roads that were accessible, not only not roads that were accessible by car or truck, they were not and often in places there weren't any roads at all. And so you could either reach cabins on horseback or you could reach them on foot. Um, and so uh, I was really excited to write about these incredible women and, uh, and what they did. It was, it was fantastic. It really does si- s- sound fantastic. Talk about heroes. You know, we talk about uh, different types of, of heroes, and there are lots of heroes in our communities. But these women, you know, brought the gift of literacy to, you know, places that, that, that wouldn't experience it otherwise. Absolutely. And I'm really glad you said that about Heroes, Jet, because one of the things that I ran into when I was writing this book was I wanted initially to write about a real woman, because, of course, these are all real people, and they were local women and girls, and they were almost all women and girls. Uh, they were all women and girls. And um, and so I wanted to, this was this book started out as nonfiction, and I wanted to write a, a little biography of, of this woman. But I was having a lot of trouble identifying um, the personal history of the woman, specific woman, a real woman, because these were all regular, ordinary people, often quite poor. They were local women and girls themselves who lived in the area, which is important because this area is so difficult to find your way around. Really, only a local could have done this kind of work. And, you know, you probably know that people don't tend to write down the histories and the biographies of regular people. Those are lost. Um, and so I had to create a composite character, a fictional character, um, that I hope has captured as many of the qualities of the real women as I could. But it is really interesting that when you go looking for a hero among regular people, it can be hard to find. It's not that their stories are less um, important or worth telling. It's that they don't often get written down. That's That really is true. I'm thinking back. There are some heroes in the neighborhood that I grew up in, and one of them was this... this uh, kind of larger than life um, storekeeper who was also rumor has it a bookie on the side, but he was just his story, you know, it was known to us and certainly nobody wrote it down, especially the bookie part, but it, his story is being shared now through social media because we're coming on and we're, you know, meeting, reconnecting with people that were in my life 30, 40 years ago. And it's like, Hey, do you remember Alan? You know, and, the store was this and that, but you know, no one ever went hungry. If anybody was there and they needed food, they needed whatever, he would always say yes. He would always give them a sandwich to let them, you know, buy something on credit. And um, and it, yeah, there, there. I think it's important for us to take time to recognize the heroes in our own lives. I completely agree. That was just such a big motivation. I really felt. Um, a lot of sort of personal positive pressure when I wrote this to really depict things as accurately as possible because I felt like that that was really the truth of their story was in these very careful and accurate details. I didn't want to make their uh, lives anything that they weren't. The, the subject has been written about before, both for young readers and also for older readers, and sometimes it can be romanticized. Um, and it was important to me to write a book that is fun and interesting and lively to read, but also was real. Um, and so I was really trying to strike that balance the whole time I was working. I really enjoy like your passion about the book and it's definitely a super interesting um, concept with the, it's so cool to think about someone riding through the country just to deliver books. And we forget that it's so much harder to um, receive these kind of resources in that area. Um, I think One thing I really want to ask you about, I know this is, it's a little bit off topic from Appalachia, but um, I was reading when I was looking into research uh, that you lived in Israel for a while. And I noticed like the books by horseback, a lot of your books actually have some pretty um, serious subjects, but you seem to make them a lot more lighthearted for kids and let them learn about things that are serious, but in a lighthearted way. So I just want to ask you about that and those kind of books that you write. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. So I did live in Israel for a year. That's where I met my husband. Um, and you know, it's not such a big, it's Israel is a very different place from Appalachia, but I am, it's half of my background. I'm half Jewish and I'm half Appalachian. Um, and so I have written books about both, um, areas I've written about, not specifically Israel, but I write a lot about Jewish history and culture. In fact, I have a, my newest book that's out is by the same publisher. Um, as books by horseback, it's called Shabbat Sabotage, and it's a mystery that takes place at Jewish summer camp for middle grade readers. Um, so, you know, while these are two very different areas, you know, in geography and in culture, uh, for me, it feels very natural to write about, about both areas. Um, and yeah, I, I write about a huge variety of topics. I often um, take books on commission that are commissioned, um, offered to me. I've sought out from publishers and one of the great challenges of my work and also one of the great fun parts is that I feel like it's my challenge to take any topic that's presented to me and make it interesting for readers. So I've written books about flesh flies and I've written books about maggots and I've written books about horses and I've written books about basketball and it doesn't matter to me if I know anything about flesh flies, not a biologist, but I am a good researcher and um, I love research. And so uh, it's always a great pleasure to me to start out on a new topic and know that I'm going to get to read all sorts of interesting books and articles about it. And then my challenge is to take that material and make it into a great story, no matter what it is. And I, I, you know, pride myself on being able to make an interesting story out of just about anything. Um, I mean, I'm always very interested and curious about whatever is going on around me. Um, it's, there's always stories that are worth telling, even if it's about maggots. Um, so yeah, yeah. This is really fascinating for me. Getting back, you refer to yourself as an Appalachian. And I have to be honest with you, the first person I've ever heard refer to themselves in that way. What does that mean to you? Oh, I love hearing you say that, Jed. Um, yeah, I feel I feel very connected to the area. So I, you mentioned at the start of the show that I um, live in Cincinnati, and Cincinnati is um, an urban place, and not many people think of it as part of Appalachia, but it, it sits at the very edge of, of what's considered Appalachia. And Cincinnati is part of um, had was part of a, 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 a time called the a Great Urban Migration or Appalachian migration. And this happened in the 1950s when um, a lot of the coal mines shut down and people left Appalachia and came to places like Cincinnati and also Dayton, which is near us, um, to work in the factories, to work in well-paid um, unionized factory jobs. And that is also what my family did. Uh, my great grandmother and her sisters, their children and their husbands all came. They were coal miners. The husbands were, my great grandfather broke his back in a coal mining accident and they he couldn't work in the mines anymore. And they came to Dayton, Ohio, which is about an hour north of us, to work in the Frigidaire factory. And a lot of these factories were like home for these um, this generation. They would work there. Your spouse would work there. You'd all work for Frigidaire. My great grandmother worked on the assembly line. Um, and, you know, your children might work there. Um, and this was really kind of a unique time. Um, obviously, a lot of those jobs have gone away since. Um, so I'm very, I feel very connected to the area. I don't live, I live in a suburb of Cincinnati, but I often go back to uh, my family's from outside of West Virginia, um, near Huntington, um, outside of Huntington in West Virginia. And um, we often go back there. Um, it's a great place for, you know, we do a lot of camping and a lot of hiking and the terrain is really unique. And I was very important to me when I was writing these books, this book to represent the terrain accurately. It's like nowhere I've ever seen. And I've lived all over the world and all over the country, as Mirabella had said. And I always feel a certain pull of homesickness when I see this terrain in photographs or things that remind me of it. Uh, you know, the area in Eastern Kentucky and in West Virginia has very, very steep um, vertical ridges um, that are also flat. And so you would walk up this sort of flat, broad ridge. It's very, very steep. And then down the other side, and then there'll be another flat, broad ridge. Uh, the mountains are very steep. And towns um, are often arranged along the rivers that flow in between the mountains. So the towns and people's homes are often in kind of vertical, narrow slots uh, with steep, extremely tree-covered mountains on, with cover of deciduous hardwood on both sides, all sides, and then these really powerful rushing um, rivers um, down at the bottom with people's homes and with small towns on the floor. 
Uh, so it's a really unique place. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really, uh, I feel, you know, I feel very attached to the terrain in particular. Uh, the terrain and the people in this book are both completely entwined. Mm-hmm. Um, it could, one could not have been, uh, existed without the other. Appalachia is one of those places that we hear about, but we don't know about. And I think it's a part of, it's a part of our country that is forgotten sometimes. And, and uh, there are a lot of people there who are um, – it's a challenging place you live. You talked about you know, the terrain and, and the, the very steep hills and, and rugged mountains. A lot – your grandfather uh, was injured as a, as a coal miner, and so many people um, mined the coal that powered our country and powered our, our growth as a nation. Uh, and many of those people suffered – uh, back injuries, they suffered uh, lung diseases from inhaling the fumes, and and then we forget about the the, the, the people and the land. And now there's a big uh, Appalachia is where uh, there are so many people who are suffering from the current opioid crisis. What can we do as a as a nation to kind of better honor and and recognize and support the people of Appalachia? That's such a great question, Jed. I mean, you know, I have my own personal, personal views um, about what Appalachia needs, but I would, you know, of course, never presume to, you know, speak for the people there. What I can offer as a storyteller um, is a window um, into um, a really vibrant part of the past. And I hope that in writing this book and offering it to people to read that, I'm helping to um, influence the impression of Appalachia and of this particular area um, in the positive way that it deserves. Um, I looked at tons of incredible archival photos when I um, wrote this book. It was because this was a WPA project. It was very well documented. And the WPA photographer actually went around with the librarians, which is why these photos exist. And um, the strength and the uh, incredible fortitude that these regular women and girls had riding out in all weather to deliver books. Uh, Their routes would be sometimes 18 miles long on horseback. They're incredibly rough terrain. Uh, They would ride through rivers. Many of them wrote that their feet would freeze to the stirrups of the saddle uh, in the winter after being uh, riding chest deep in in these very dangerous rivers. Um, some places were too ex- inaccessible, even for horses. And uh, the librarians would either lead their horses on foot or they would uh, they would have to stand at sort of a general meeting area. And one librarian would, would stash kind of a big horn in a bush and she would uh, blow on this really big horn and people would come down on foot to, uh, to get their books. So I feel like in terms of sort of what I can bring um, I can bring these stories and offer them up. Um, people can take them, obviously, or or they can not take them. But that's what I can sort of that's what I can kind of offer to this thing. I sort of it's an ode to an area that I really love. Yeah, wonderful. I I think that's I think it's really important. I think it's a great place for us to start is to meet the people who live there. That's great. I completely agree. Yeah. One of the things, that, one of the reasons we're doing this series, well, the only reason we're doing this series is because Mirabella came up with with this idea. And I'm just curious, Mirabella, and maybe Emma is too. I know that you don't live in Appalachia. You live here in Massachusetts. Uh, what is it about the area that so intrigues you? Well, for one, I've always been super interested in the history of the U.S. And I think Appalachia can be kind of the forgotten history. People forget about the people who live there. To be completely honest, I absolutely love Dolly Parton. And my first like exposure to Appalachia when I was younger was watching an interview and she talked about growing up in that area. And it just intrigued me so much. And I just, I love her music and I love her, her, um, she's so charitable. And I just think she has such a good nature towards two people. And I think that might come from that a little bit, but I just, I really love her stories. And I thought it would be interesting to explore. The other thing is I'm a huge, I love like folklore and any kind of uh, tales. And I was just thinking of, I know uh, West Virginia, we were talking about um, the Mothman was a big like lore in Appalachian areas. And so was the Flatwoods monster. So that was like, 
very interesting. I love hearing the origins of these like folklore that gets passed down through word of mouth. So that also really intrigued me. As as an Appalachian, when you hear um, a young student from uh, from Massachusetts uh, talking about her interest in, in Appalachia, I, I'm looking at you. Just have this big smile go across your face, Emma. What what are your thoughts as you're hearing Mar- Mirabella? I mean, I'm just loving hearing it. And you know, Mirabella, you're talking about how there's a lot of really great stories, and you know, uh, Appalachia is rich with all kinds of folk tales and legends and myths. And I personally feel like it's it's a um, result of again of the geographic isolation that a lot of sort of physically isolated places. Um, tend to develop a lot of stories about why things are, why people are, you know, people sort of stay in there among themselves and tell their stories over and over again and develop them. Um, it tends to be a place where people don't leave a lot. They don't tend to come and they don't tend to go. They stay. Um, and I'm just, I really enjoy, you know, um, hearing you say that. I also lived in Massachusetts and I would say that I did not discuss Appalachia a lot when I was there. I lived in Cambridge. I worked in Andover and, um, there wasn't a lot of interest and, you know, um, as someone who's, uh, you know, a lifelong Cincinnatian, I can say that I feel like people in the area feel mixed about, about, um, about Appalachia. A lot of people go there for recreation, but there's also sometimes a lot of sort of negative feelings that this place is poverty stricken, that it's, you know, beset by drugs, that it's scary. Um, and uh, I'm really, you know, uh, uh, fully on board to, you know, to try to uh, dispel some of those myths because I consider them myths completely. Yeah. Well, I think one of the, one of the first steps in, in, helping people help themselves is just recognizing a country and, and seeing people. And, and, um, and I'm really excited that you are representing the people and the women of Appalachia in such a positive way. And I'm hoping that young girls in Appalachia can read your book and, and just see these very strong, brave women. And imagine themselves being strong, being brave, and doing some incredible things with their lives as well. Thanks, Chad. Uh, one thing I just wanted to ask was if you plan on writing more books on Appalachia, because you have so many books over so many topics. And if this writing this book inspired you to just do more on your on your home home front. <laughs> I actually, I would love to write more books about um, this area. I'd love to write um, a middle grade version of this book, um, Books by Horseback, and tell more of the story. I talked to um, a very wise um, older author, um, Debbie Levy, who wrote I Descent about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and she had told me, uh, you know, you do all of this research and, you know, only a fraction of it makes it into the picture book and that, you know, you're just... You're just itching to get the rest of the research out there. So if there's ever the opportunity, um, it is definitely something I would like to do. Hey, um, Emma, at the top of the show, you mentioned that that you had fictionalized the story, but but the story is about some real life women. Um, is there any women in particular that we can just kind of honor and recognize and share their names? Um, you know, Jed, there are many. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not. You know, um, without the permission of their family, not totally comfortable sharing their names in particular. Um, but I read many of their stories. Um, some of the stories I read in particular were gathered by the Pine Mountain Settlement School. And I'd like to give a shout out to them and to their archivist, Helen Weichel. Um, H- Helen is the archivist of the school and the uh, settlement schools were boarding schools for uh, mainly high schools for children and teenagers in Appalachia and uh, in the 1930s and, and in other decades. And um, Helen has maintained an incredible archive at that school, a lot of which centers around the Pack Horse uh, Library Project, um, because a lot of the librarians were teenagers and they would do this as part of their work study. Um, so Helen and I spoke and she offered me some um, absolutely incredible, incredible um, sort of details. And I looked at her in, in meticulous archive over and over again. Uh, and if you don't mind, Jed, I'd like to uh, do a couple other shout outs to people who helped me um, with this book, if that's okay. Sure. Um, uh, in particular, um, Jeannie Schmitzer. So Jeannie is the author of Down Cut Shin Creek, which is a nonfiction middle grade 
story of the Pack Horse Librarians. And we spoke several times on the phone, and she told me many details um, and interesting tidbits that are just not available, um, you know, in, in books and in articles um, that she had found in her own uh, primary research. And she was uh, incredibly helpful to me. And the other person that I wanted to give a shout out to was Neil Kasiak. Um, Neil is an oral historian and a professor, um, and he runs the Appalachian Equine Project at Eastern Kentucky University. This book is about librarians, but it's also about horses. I'm a very horsey person myself. I love horses. I ride them. I love to write about animals and in particular horses. And um, a lot of the horses that the librarians rode um, were uh, bred specially for the mountains um, over generations. They were very uh, small. They were good at going up and down hills. They were very strong. They were used to the terrain. Um, and uh, Neil has studied these horses and gathered stories about them. And I listened to many archival interviews of uh, people talking about uh, their horses and what they meant to them. Um, and he was incredibly helpful to me also. And his, uh, I would encourage everyone to check out the Appalachian Equine Project um, at Eastern Kentucky University's webpage because it is fascinating. Wow. Wow. Wonderful. Um, Mirabelle, imagine if uh, that was your internship, kind of getting on the horses and bringing the books through Appalachia. I would love that. I competed horses for 15 years, so that is like a dream to me. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Emma, where can we go to find out more about you and find out more about your wonderful books? Yes, so um, feel free to visit my website, which is by first and last name. So it's uh, Emma Carlson Byrne um, dot com. And there you'll find links to all of my books. Uh, You can also get in touch with me by email. Um, And there's a little biography about me there, too. Wonderful. We've had a great time speaking to the author of Books by Horseback, Emma Carlson Byrne. Hey, Emma, thanks so much for being with Mirabella and I. Thank you so much for having me, Jed. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Kristen Lee. She'll be here to celebrate Sun Keep Rising. That's the next episode of the podcast. Hey, if you haven't already done so, please visit drawingwithyourkids.com. It's our new companion project. It is fantastic. We've invited illustrators, some of the best illustrators in children's literature, to teach you and your kids how to draw characters from their books. You're going to love it. It's really a lot of fun. Check it out today, drawingwithyourkids.com. It's also available on our YouTube page, the Reading With Your Kids YouTube page. Check it out today. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we're going to start by thanking our guest, Emma Carson Byrne. Also, I want to thank my incredible co-host, Mirabella Q. She did she's such a great part of the team in the fall 2022 semester and also the summer 2022 semester. I also want to thank the rest of my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Jordan Saley, Stephanie Davila, Will Cheever, Cassandra Masonet, Sabrina Wu. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.